Thank you so much, everybody, for inviting me to speak with you today about mammalian whole brain circuit mapping. I'm Andrew Payne. I'm co-founder and CEO at E11Bio, which is building the technology that we need to map the brain. OK, so the core idea I want to communicate today is that precision brain mapping is going to be transformative for neurotech, for BCI, and for AI safety. It's really at like the you know, trunk of the tech trees that you know, we are building in all of these areas. And I also want to you know, talk a little bit about what we're doing at E11Bio to build a very scalable platform to do this precision brain mapping. OK, so to make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, scaled brain mapping at the scale of you know, brains or nervous systems is called connectomics. And so you know, we've been mapping brain circuits for like 100 years, but in a really ad hoc way, you know, one at a time. What we really want to do is to be able to do this very rapidly in a high throughput way at scale in many different brains. Because if you can do that, then you have a platform for discovery. And we've seen from genomics that you know, once you have a discovery platform, a field can make a lot of progress in, relatively speaking, not that long a time. Think about genomics in 2003 versus today. A billion dollar genome versus a $100 genome. So you know, this unlocks opportunities if you can do this sort of discovery. It really helps you understand and will enable understanding of you know, how brains compute, you know, how cognition works, what is the like, mechanistic hard circuit basis for you know, how cognition works and other brain functions. And it also you know, helps us understand you know, what can go wrong in different brain disorders. You know, why do we have mood disorders? Um, just to riff on the previous topic. Um, as well as you know, all sorts of other, other disease areas and disorder areas. So um, you know, this is like very you know, fundamental at the, at the you know, trunk of the tree. And so you know, there are three areas I want to really highlight today that I want to focus on um, for neurotech and BCI and AI safety. Um, so you know, the first area is brain-inspired AI. You know, how does connectomics help with AI safety? And you know, the human brain is the only example that we have of aligned general intelligence. And so if we want to know things about general intelligence, we should really be studying it and trying to you know, accelerate how quickly we can, can like, get to work. Um, and so you know, sort of like, what would that mean? Well, for instance, you could start, if you had connectomes of brains, you could start mining them to see what are circuits that you know, encode social instincts. Is that a thing? Well, some people think it might be. So you know, on uh, the Alignment Forum, actually, Steve Burns has a great you know, uh, essay series on you know, one hypothesis towards you know, how hard-coded genetic circuits in the brainstem might be exhibiting supervisory control over the cortex. Could we learn how to make AI architectures from studying these neural systems? We have to make the tools to find out. OK, second, whole brain, brain emulation. So this is, uh, we're still very far off from being able to emulate a brain. But you know, there are some pieces to this, or at least a mammalian brain. But there's some pieces to this that have already come into play that are really sort of encouraging. So you know, we've seen now from the fruit fly connectome. The fruit fly connectome was finally finished last year, and people have been working on it ever since to you know, do various modeling tasks. And what we found is that you know, when you take a network and you, you know, pre-constrain it with the same weights and connections that you have in a fly brain, you can very rapidly recapitulate activity that uh, is analogous to the biological behavior. This is you know, uh, a very hard search problem that you can get to by pre-configuring your architecture in particular ways. And so you know, even having some constraints uh, at the mechanistic circuit level can allow you to reduce the number of free parameters in your model by orders of magnitude. Um, and uh, that will be very encouraging as we you know, start experimenting with you know, approaches to brain emulation, including you know, so-called lo-fi approaches or soft approaches that have also been you know, mooted recently. OK, third, brain-computer interfaces. Um, how does connectomics help with BCI? Well, OK, first of all, you know, as we get better ways of neuromodulation, we need to figure out what are they going to target. And you know, a lot of these brain structures are very small and precise. You know, small nuclei that are only you know, like hundreds or tens of microns across, yet are critical 
to you know, how uh, brains compute. And so we need to be able to discover which ones are important in particular you know, situations, and then uh, you know, map, measure, and modulate um, to gain an overall understanding of how the system works. And so if you, can't have the, if you, do, if you don't have the mapping, then uh, you can't do the discovery process. You also need other tools, to be clear. So for instance, uh, optogenetic technologies are super critical for being able to both manipulate and uh, in some cases even monitor uh, the uh, activity of the cell. And so all of this is going to be really important for neuromodulation. The other area is biohybrid BCI. So right now, you know, I think people are very excited about you know, introducing engineered cells into the brain in order to you know, achieve particular functions um, or you know, uh, correct for you know, traumatic brain injury or things like that. Um, but when you put neurons into the brain, they integrate kind of randomly. They don't know what to connect to. They're developmental cues over the life cycle of the animal that you know, circuits don't, uh, won't respond to if you implant them in an adult animal. So being able to you know, work out how to get these circuits to integrate correctly is a key challenge right now. And you can't do that if you can't see how they connect up. So you know, hopefully I've convinced you, or at least you know, uh, set the stage for uh, thinking about why getting the circuit information is actually you know, critical catalytic for all of these areas. I also, you know, it's not the focus of, of the you know, topic today, but I do want to mention that also it's just super useful for human health. So, you know, this includes like longevity. You know, a lot of people I think are very excited about, you know, cell replacement therapies. And again, you need to be able to measure how they integrate in order to design them in a design build test loop towards, you know, normal um, integration patterns. Uh, the technology, and you'll see this in a minute, but the technology for, you know, brain mapping is also you know, super important just at like, the um, implementation level for gene and cell therapies. We're really excited about that. And then finally, you know, there's, there's a bunch of brain disorders that we simply do not understand. We don't know the details. And being able to go in and map them out is the first step in order to, uh, in, in working towards treating them. So to unlock, so, so this, is, this is great, right? Um, these goals are ambitious, but um, uh, are they attainable? Right now, no. We don't have the right tools to get the data. So you know, we've mapped the fruit fly brain, but we have to go beyond that in order to make these things more than you know, speculation. We have to you know, make this actionable. We have to you know, uh, get better tools to enable scalable and transformative progress. And so at E11, you know, mapping the mouse connectome is really our north star or like critical aim point. Um, because, and in order to talk about that, I need to talk about you know, what are the limitations of current approaches. So right now, when you map the brain, you need to slice it into 100,000 pieces. Um, you take pictures of each of those pieces with electron microscopes, and then you computationally stitch it back together. This is very fragile. If you damage a slice, you can't continue tracing the neurons between these sections. And so you know, it's been very, you know, this has worked well for a fly brain, and this has worked kind of OK for you know, chunks of, of cortical tissue. But scaling this up towards a whole mouse brain doesn't look tractable, at least in the next five to 10 years. So what do we do instead? Well, OK, first of all, just to be clear, you know, the issues are, are twofold. One is um, subvolume reconstruction, so you know, slicing the brain into a bunch of pieces. But the other is actually a computer vision problem. Even with the very, very best computer vision that we have today, um, you cannot accurately reconstruct the connectome from these images. You have to have humans go in and proofread the results of the computer vision. And this is, this is very laborious. It needs like a hundred person years of proofreading to get a fly brain. So that doesn't scale either. And, you, and you know, this, is, this is just an example of how much it doesn't scale. Um, in order to do uh, you know, one mouse brain with current technologies, you, know, you need to image it, but you also need to you know, uh, segment it with computer vision and proofread it. And those two pieces, those last two pieces, are 99% of the cost. So you know, when we, uh, so, this, so this is a bottleneck. This is a real bottleneck in order to actually do mammalian connectomics. And so um, a few years ago, some friends and I you know, did, did a back of the envelope and got to that conclusion and asked, OK, so if that's where the bottleneck is, what would unlock scalable progress in mammalian connectomics? And we concluded that new technology was what was needed. So there were two breakthroughs in the last you know, 10 years that have really changed the, the nature of the game. One of the technologies is cell barcoding. So you know, this has really transformed genomics, and, and single cell genomics in particular. But you know, the idea is simple. You deliver 
uh, combinations of biomolecules, unique combinations of biomolecules to individual cells that then encode their identity. They each get an ID tag, basically. And you can read these ID tags out optically. The second technology is multiplexed expansion microscopy. Um, for a long time, people have used electron microscopes because they were the only game in town, the only technology with the resolution necessary to see synapses, the connections between cells. But now we know how to make tissues physically bigger while maintaining all of the biomolecular fine structure that we care about. And so you can now see synapses optically in light microscopes. And when you put these two things together, then you have a really cool opportunity, which we called optical barcode connectomics, or just barcode connectomics. And so instead of looking at shapes in grayscale electron microscopy images, what we do instead is read out iteratively virally delivered ID codes that correspond to the cell identity. And we can do that by iteratively imaging in different colors in order to build up a color vector for every cell or even every voxel in the 3D image. And so what does that mean? It means when, for instance, I have this cell in the motor cortex, uh, area A, and I want to know if an axon in area B corresponds to it. I look at the color code in area A, I look at the color code in area B, and I see if they match. And if the color codes are long enough, you can drive down the likelihood of a false positive by orders of magnitude. And so then when they match, you've essentially reconstructed the functional effective connectivity of the neuron without needing to trace it all the way down the axon. So this is, this is very robust and error tolerant. Um, and so, you know, in, in a nutshell, uh, at a glance, the way that the method works is that you deliver barcodes to the brain, you perform iterative imaging with expansion microscopy to read out the color codes, and then you uh, employ computer vision and barcode matching algorithms to map uh, cell bodies or other you know, areas of interest in the neuron to its fine processes, which can be many millimeters away. And so this is intrinsically scalable. Instead of you know, worrying about whether you're going to lose or damage a section, you rely on the barcodes to bridge gaps or damage slices. You can just pick it up again. Um, and instead of needing humans to extensively proofread these, these maps, uh, the barcodes, in some sense, are self-proofreading, error correcting. And so you know, we think now we can remove, in the limit, that segmentation box and that proofreading box to get a 100-fold cost reduction versus current approaches to connectomics. And you know, the focused research organization model is what enables this. Um, we're going to hear more about that later, so I'm going to you know, leave that there for now. Um, and now I want to spend the last you know, five minutes talking about what progress have we made so far towards unlocking and realizing the potential of barcode connectomics? So, you know, uh, I'm really excited to talk about some of the milestones scientifically that we've hit in each of these areas. In barcoding, you know, when we started, this was just an idea. You know, the most uh, you know, diversity at the protein level that people have observed in, in neurons has been, you know, about 100 different combinations, and there's 100 million cells in the mouse. And so, you know, we set our initial goal to be you know, 15 bit long barcodes. That's two to the 15, or 32,000 different possible combinations. And you know, we didn't necessarily think it would work. Um, you can inject, again, you can inject these barcodes, say, in the motor cortex, and you can see expression. But you know, they have to go all the way down the axon and you know, make it to the axon terminals. And so you know, we tried this experiment. And on the very first try, we were able to see beautiful expression in the superior colliculus, which is the very end of the axons of these, uh, of these motor neurons. And you, know, you, could, you could just see the synapses. These are the little bulges, the synaptic boutons in the, in the bottom frames. Um, and we were like, wow, this has been a hard problem for you know, 20 years. And we have traction now. Um, and so then we started screening more possible candidates for these, for these barcodes, the different combinations of molecules that make up the barcode. And we found you know, a second one and a third one. And before long, we had found you know, our initial library of 15 bits, our goal for the first you know, phase of our program. And actually, we kept going. Now we're at 23. Um, and uh, what that means, because the scales exponentially, is that you know, we are getting very close to the point where you could imagine barcoding every cell in a brain. You know, um, when we started, you know, like I said, uh, there was a little bit of diversity. But uh, you can see how with like 15 barcodes, you can see like 10,000 things. But you know, with, with 20. Five barcodes, you can see a million things. And with 40 barcode bits, you could see you know, 1 11 things, 100 billion things, which is enough in principle to label every cell in a human brain. But that's another story for another day. OK, imaging. 
Um, you also, if you can write these barcodes to the mouse brain, you also have to read them out all at the same time. And this is really tough because on a typical microscope, you have like five colors and there, there's 15 things. How do you do that? And so, you know, we developed a protocol for reading all of these things out of the same sample. And you can see that here, you know, at 15 nanometer re resolution, we have, you know, all of these different colors corresponding to one of these 32,000 different possible combinations. And so, you know, you can look at a single bit at a time and, you know, let's highlight the cell over here and you can actually see, you know, in which channels it received a barcode bit or it didn't. And that constitutes the overall barcode for the cell. Okay. Finally, on the neuroanatomy front. So, you know, uh, we can now write barcodes to, the, barcodes to the mouse brain. We can read them back from the mouse brain. Um, but, you know, can we scalably do that? And so what you're looking at on the left are these uh, cell bodies from neurons. And they've been segmented with computer vision. So we still need computer vision in the loop um, in order to segment the morphology. But um, now you can start looking. Is this me or is it? Okay. Thank you. So in the middle, you have um, some of the so rows and neurons columns are whether it got a bit or not. And you know, for the first time ever, um, and this was the you know, data that we wanted to see to convince ourselves this was actually working and we could do connectomics optically, you know, we were able to pull out individual unique barcodes for each of these cells. And you can do that for every cell in that volume, or you can even apply it to a bigger volume. So you know, this is. Uh, you know, what we were looking for, um, this sort of de the initial part of the project. And you know, what's next on the roadmap? Well, now we are trying to scale this up um, and apply it to bigger volumes of mouse tissue. Um, and I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to step forward for a second. And so that's what this is. You know, we've recently applied this in Mouse Hippocampus um, and have gotten some you know, very cool results. Uh, you can see, for instance, this pyramidal cell layer in the middle, which corresponds to you know, individual neurons in the CA3 area. You can see apical dendrites, basal dendrites, astrocytes. We're really excited about you know, the potential for this to start being used in brain tissue. And so you know, speculatively, you know, what is the timeline for this? Well, as an FRO, you know, we're working on a really hard technical problem, and that takes time. And so you know, we're still working on the core tech development. And you know, in a couple of years, we hope to start scaling this towards some really large volumes, you know, approaching the, the level of the whole mouse brain. Um, but you know, one, one thing that I think um, corresponds pretty well with the spirit of Lab Week is like, you know, how can we do this faster? You know, what would make this go even faster? And so uh, some of the areas that we're thinking about um, to accelerate the tech dev include starting some of these explorations around you know, neurotech and BCI and AI safety now rather than in a couple of years. Because you know, being able to get traction in some of these areas early would be really helpful, you know, like feedback and also you know, an opportunity to develop potentially products that could you know, fuel even you know, more accelerated R&D. But that's you know, very speculative at this point. And it's the same thing for therapeutics. But you know, I think everyone can you know, agree that the, the potential of getting fast R&D going for uh, brain mapping is a critical step if we want to you know, make neurotech and BCI and AI safety viable in the near term. So with that, I'm just going gonna, gonna to close out. Um, I, uh, we have an amazing team at E11. I'm so lucky to be working with like, talents and scientists who came from all over the world to the Bay Area to work on this hard problem, in particular, Gene Axop over here, um, who was at IndieBio for five years and brings you know, the ops and startup side of things to E11. And also, you know, Kathleen and Sven and Johan, who have been running, you know, the individual pillars that make up the overall E11 pipeline, and the rest of the team too. It's incredible. Thank you.